should be accessible when people need to know. But I don't think you have much hope of, of reaching a public that doesn't have a professional need to know. I, I completely agree with that. I almost think you'd scare the public if you put this out. Like, why are they telling me this? Should I be concerned about my bank? Like, my insurance company doesn't tell me what they're doing with my assets. So they just assume they're going to pay my claim. Right? It's, it's, I, I think you've got to think of the unintended consequences of taking a public that has more full faith and confidence in the banking system than maybe people in this room do, <laughs> that we want them to have full faith and confidence in the banking system. They know the FDIC insurance is there. They know it works. They put their money in. They're going to get their money out. So there, there's a select crowd of people that are in the institutional side. And if they want to understand this, they're going to find a way to understand this. There's a bunch of law firms represented in this room. There's a bunch of people who charge them by the hour a lot of money to explain this all to them. And, and, and it's fine. And I, I, don't have a, I don't have a problem with that. And they all have huge staffs. But I would be careful about the unintended consequences of starting to blast too much of this out in the general public. I wondered whether there are some market tests of whether you're being heard. And I think about TLAC. So TLAC should spread should respond to good and bad news about the institutions. And it's really important. I mean, it's a little bit conflicted, right? I mean, it's important that people understand they can be bailed in, but you don't want a huge run on the institution. But they have, I mean, they're going to be. That's and and it could be an early warning signal to the FDIC and the primary regulators when these things happen. And there may be some other prices, this is uh, similar to what Jay was saying, in the market that you can tell whether people understand how the, who's going to be protected, who isn't going to be protected. It would be, I think, an interesting study to look at the evolution of market prices in a situation like March of 2020, for example, and see whether people understood what might happen. I, I'd like to go back to, to some of Dick's early comments. I do think it is hard to get a lot of demand for transparency right now in this in this sort of period of peacetime. But that is going to flip, and it's going to flip probably even faster than we saw in 2008, where the need for communications really quickly in the social media world uh, to avoid disinformation, to have some holding patterns for things like, I remember in the early days of bail-in, people saying, they're coming for my deposits, right? So just holding, just holding communications that you can pull out that are helpful to deal with disinformation, some very simple things, um, and how quickly you'll be able to deal with different constituencies. Um, for example, as liabilities are further up and closer to harm's way, when are you going to be able to give them some comfort, if any? How do you deal with uh, foreign operations? Uh, how do you communicate to some of those different groups? I, I think ex ante preparation for the speed of scaling up and the ability to get information out to avoid rumors taking over the, the narrative strikes me as probably the place that feels like it's got the most benefit. What's up, guys? Today is Tuesday, March 14th. And unfortunately, last Friday, the bank runs have begun. In this video, I want to explain to you how Janet Yellen can say that bailouts will not be happening for the Silicon Valley Bank because bail-ins have been put into the fine print of banks since the reform that happened right after the last financial crisis when we bailed out the banks. So I'm gonna jump in right away as usual. Welcome or welcome back to my channel, Michigan Muckraker. My name is Michelle and I appreciate you joining me today. So without further ado, we're gonna get in. As it says here, Yellen says, there will be no bailout for collapsed Silicon Valley Bank. This was March 12th, 2023. And she can say that and not be a liar because they aren't going to bail out the banks this time, they're going to bail them in. So the world experienced a major upheaval during the 2007 and 2008 financial crisis. The problems didn't happen overnight. In fact, they were years in the making. Rock bottom interest rates led to an increase in borrowing, which was a boon to existing and prospective homeowners, but it would prove to become a bubble destined to burst one that would greatly impact not only consumers, but also some of the world's major banks. 
Great Recession that followed ushered in the term too big to fail. Regulators and politicians used it to describe the rationale for rescuing some of the country's largest financial institutions with taxpayer-funded bailouts, heeding the public's displeasure over the use of tax dollars in such a way, Congress passed the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Act in January of 2010, which eliminated the option of bank bailouts, but opened the door for bank bail-ins. Key takeaways. Big banks were deemed too big to fail following the financial crisis of 2007 and 2008, resulting in government's, government bailouts at the expense of taxpayers. Financial reforms ushered in with the Dodd-Frank Act eliminated bailouts and opened the door for bail-ins. Bail-ins allow banks to convert debt into equity to increase their capital requirements. They shift the risk to unsecured creditors, including depositors whose account balances exceed the FDIC limit of $250,000. You can avoid bail-ins by spreading your assets across different banks and by monitoring changes in financial regulations. Bank bail-in versus bank bailout. Bail-ins and bailouts both serve the same purpose. They are designed to prevent the complete collapse of a failing bank. But the difference between the two lies primarily in who bears the financial burden of rescuing the bank. With bailouts, the government injects capital into banks, enabling them to continue their operations. During the financial crisis, the government bailed out major banks by injecting $700 billion into names like Bank of America, Citigroup, and American International Group. Since the government doesn't have its own money, it used taxpayer funds. This should have never happened. They should have just failed. But I'm sure we all know that by now, we just allowed that to happen. Bail-ins work a little differently, providing immediate relief. Banks use money from their unsecured creditors, including depositors and bondholders, to restructure their capital to stay afloat. Put simply, they can convert their debt into equity to increase their capital requirements. Although depositors run the risk of losing some of their deposits, banks can only use deposits in, in excess of $250,000 protection provided by the FDIC. Unsecured creditors, depositors, and bondholders fall below derivative claims. Derivatives are investments that banks make among each other, which are supposed to be used to hedge their portfolios. However, the 25 largest banks hold more than $247 trillion in derivatives, which poses a tremendous amount of risk to the financial system. To avoid a potential calamity, the Dodd-Frank Act gives preference to derivative claims. $247 trillion. I know that we're like $50 trillion. I haven't looked in a while. And debt is like, I can't even imagine a million, guys let alone a trillion, let alone 247 trillion. We, we have to know that we're at the end of this form of banking. The bank runs have just begun of 2023, but this, unfortunately, is a controlled demolition to bring about the central bank digital currency. No one would, would not no one, not very many people, would volunteer to switch over to the central bank digital currency, knowing that using that currency, the government sees every single thing you purchase and do. And there's no cash in the central bank digital currency system that they want to put in place. So in order for the CBDC to come into being, you have to collapse the old system. You have to turn the Twin Towers into the one. Bail-ins become statutory. Just like bailouts, bail-ins take place when banks are too big to fail, but banks end up using their own capital when governments don't have money in their coffers to bail them out. Giving banks the power to use debt as equity takes the pressure and honest off taxpayers. As such, banks are responsible to their shareholders, debt holders, and depositors. The provision for bank bail-ins in the Dodd-Frank Act was largely mirrored after the cross-border framework and requirements set forth in Basel III International Reforms II. 
for the banking system of the European Union. It creates statutory balance given the Federal Reserve, the FDIC, and the Securities and Exchange Commission, SEC, the authority to place bank holding companies and large non-bank holding companies in receivership under federal control. Since the principal objective of the provision is to protect the American taxpayers, banks that are too big to fail will no longer be bailed out by taxpayer dollars. Instead, they will be bailed in. Europe experiments with bail-ins. One of the key examples of the use of bail-ins was in Cyprus, a country saddled with high debt and the potential for bank failures. The country's banking industry grew at alarming rate after the Cyprus joined the European Union and the Eurozone. This growth, coupled with risky investments in the Greek market and risky loans from two large domestic lenders, led to the need for government intervention in 2013. A bailout wasn't possible, as the federal government didn't have access to global financial markets or loans. Instead, it instituted the bail-in policy, forcing depositors with more than 100,000 euros to write off a portion of their holdings. A levy of 47.5%. Although the action prevented bank failures, it led to unease among the financial markets in Europe over the possibility that these bail-ins may become more widespread. Investors are concerned that the increased risk to bondholders will drive yields higher and discourage bank deposits. With the banking systems in many European countries distressed by low and negative interest rates, more bank bail-ins are, strongly, are strong, a strong possibility. So basically, here in America, if you have more than $250,000 in the bank, so say you're a business, and you have more than $250,000 in one bank, and the bank fails, anything over that $250,000, so let's say you have a million, then $750,000 the bank will seize to bail itself out, but it's a bail-in. So you are paying for your bank to stay afloat. That's why at the very beginning, it says a solution is to diversify. So if you only have 250000 in 15 different banks, then the FDIC will cover your ass. But if you have all of your money in one bank and that bank fails, it'll take all of your money except for 250000 to bail itself out, to pay the people that it needs to pay, whoever that is. If you think bailouts were bad, I mean, they, they were bad, but bail-ins are going to be just as bad in, in a different way. Although the action prevented bank failures, it led to unease. Okay, in 2013, the EU introduced resolutions to make the bail-in a common principle by 2016 in response to the effects of the European sovereign debt crisis. It transferred the responsibility of a failing bank system from taxpayers to unsecured creditors and bondholders the same way Dodd-Frank did in the United States. How to protect your assets. With bailouts, governments inject money back into troubled banks and corporations to help them avoid bankruptcy. But this isn't the case with bail-ins because banks use the money they have available from depositors and unsecured creditors to help them avoid failure. That means your money may be at risk of being used to help your bank keep itself afloat. Remember that bail-ins are the new norm. Dodd-Frank aimed to protect taxpayers from costly bailouts by allowing banks to use bail-in provisions, putting the onus on and shifting the risk to unsecured creditors, debt holders, as well as common and preferred state shareholders. This also includes depositors whose account balances are in excess of the FDIC insured limit. So what does this mean for consumers? Banks have the authority to take control of any capital that fits the criteria as per the law. This means anyone who has an account that exceeds 250,000 insured limit may be affected. Anything above that amount can be used for bail-in purposes. So I hope you understand that. I don't know if it's too late at this point because the banks have started collapsing, but it, they could try to slow it down some way, print more money. I, the Federal Reserve, the creature from Jekyll Island, Federal Reserve Bank, highly recommend you get this book by Edward Griffith. Um, 
sorry, Griffin, not Griffith, Griffin. Um, this explains everything you need to know about the cartel, the banking cartel that is the Federal Reserve banking system. And in the back, it actually discusses this pessimistic scenario that we are seeing and that we're going to continue to see unfold in 2023. So if you pick this up, you go back to the pessimistic scenario section that's in the 500s, and you'll get an idea of, unfortunately, what's going to happen. And this was written in the 90s. 93, I believe, was the OG. So this is the fifth edition, but the original, with majority of this information, was written in the 90s. So how did he guess what was going to happen unless he read the plans of the Federal Reserve Bank and the Club of Rome and World Economic Forum and all these people that try to run the world. Whether you like it or not, or whether you know about it or not, they do try to steer how the world works. And they've been doing it since at least the 60s. But the Federal Reserve came into place in uh, 1913, 1914, right around the time the income tax came into place. Because income tax is not constitutional. That's an amendment. Anyway, I highly suggest you pick this up if you want to understand the banking cartel. If you want to protect your assets, here are a few tips you may want to take into account. Keep a watchful eye on the performance of financial markets. Ensure the financial institutions you choose are financially secure and stable. Spread the risk by diversifying your money and assets across different banks and countries. Keep balances at or below the $250,000 limit. Make sure you monitor any changes to federal government policies about bank deposits. Don't bank with any institution that has large derivative and mortgage books, which can be risky in times of crisis. Bail-ins allow banks to help avoid bankruptcy by shifting some of the risks to their creditors rather than to taxpayers. This risk can be transferred to bank customers too. If you want to avoid the effects of a bank bail-in, make sure you are aware of the financial stability of the financial institutions, which you do business, and ensure you diversify your assets and holding across, across, across different banks and credit unions. You can also help keep your savings intact by monitoring changes to regulations. Thank you very much for joining me. I hope you're doing well today. Uh, how do I protect myself from bank bail-in? You can protect yourself by taking several steps. First, make sure you monitor the financial markets. Keep up to date and don't have more than $250,000 in the bank. Are bank bail-ins legal in the United States? Bank bail-ins are legal in the United States. They become the new norm with the passing of the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Act, which was ushered in as a response to the Great Recession. The federal government will no longer inject taxpayer dollars to prevent big bank failure. Yes, bail-ins are something else. When they say that they've reformed and that we don't have to worry about bailouts, well, they don't ever talk about bail-ins. Very scary stuff if you have over $250,000 in the bank. And even if you don't, if the bank does end up bailing itself in, will people still have access to the money of that bank? The bottom line, big banks learned a very important lesson following the financial crisis and the Great Recession that ensued. Despite receiving billions in bailouts, recovering, and repaying back the money they received, they're still not immune to the effects of financial instability. Rather than put the onus on taxpayers, though, the federal government shifted the risks to creditors by allowing financial institutions the ability to use debt capital to keep themselves afloat. This means that debt holders, unsecured creditors, shareholders, and depositors may be responsible for problems within the financial sector. So if you're worried about what this means for you, for your bottom line, make sure you follow up. It's funny how they protect the wealthy corporations and not the people. They also spend the money to protect corporations, but the future generations end up paying for it. You're right, Corey. The future generations do pay for all of our mistakes, and yet we continue to make them and not 
fixing anything. We just keep kicking the can down the road. But the central bank digital currency is on the way, unfortunately. I'm going to switch over to this out of the Detroit News. Uh, Comerica Bank, other financial institutions, stocks plunge after Silicon Valley Bank collapse. So this is going to get into a couple Michigan banks, including Independent Bank, which is a, a big bank, well, a small bank that's frequently in towns around here. Bank stocks fell Monday, including those of institutions with a large presence in Michigan. The drop comes in light of the closure of Silicon Valley Bank as investors withdrew billions of dollars from the bank within hours on Friday. The stock prices of banks with a large local presence in Michigan were down overall on Monday, with some faring better than others. As of close Monday, Comerica Bank stock was at 42.53 a share, down 27%. Ouch. Huntington Bank shares stock was at $11 a share at close, down 16.8%. Stock shares for New York Community Bancor, which owns Flagstar Bank, were at $6.41, which is down 13.03%. And Grand Rapids based independent bank stock was at $18.40 a share, down 8%. That's not as drastic, but still concerning. Grand Rapids-based Mercantile Bank stock was at $30.16 a share, down 7.68%, and J.P. Morgan was at 131.25 a share, down 1%. Of course, J.P. Morgan's down the least. U.S. regulators closed Silicon Valley Bank after it was hit by a bank run. It is the second largest bank failure in U.S. history, behind only the 2008 failure of Washington Mutual. New York-based Signature Bank also failed. President Joe Biden sought Monday to reassure bank customers that the nation's financial systems and their deposits were safe. Your deposits will be there when you need them, he said. Banking experts say that Silicon Valley Bank had a set of challenges that would not carry over to the other banks. Those issues include poor balance sheet management, said Wang, founder and general partner of California-based Rain Capital. However, the Silicon Valley Bank's immediate ecosystems, its customers, partners, and suppliers are impacted, and the stock dip today is the market's reaction to that, she said. So, I read an article, and I probably should have brought this up, but uh, I read an article that Silicon Valley Bank was doing everything by regulation, and that there shouldn't have been that problem, if regulations actually mean or do anything. Wang said she doesn't expect banks more diversified than Silicon Valley to experience the same issue long term. I think that those are all good banks, and I think that they will all recover. Talking about Comerica Bank, PCN, and Fifth Third. Nash noted that as of Monday afternoon, the stock price for J.P. Morgan Chase had fallen about 1.5. That's not bad at all. Of course, it's J.P. Morgan, though. If the biggest bank that's going to fail is going to be Wells Fargo first. That's my bet. I mean, it could be Bank of America. What do you think? I think it's going to be Bank of America or Wells Fargo. And I hate to, I obviously don't want any banks to fail, although they're the bane of America's existence. The Federal Reserve has destroyed America slowly. So, is your microphone working properly? Sounds like you have sound and another output. I will look into that. Thank you. I hope it's not too bad that you can hear fairly clearly. Is it terrible? That is what's going on with the 10-year bond yield and gold Bitcoin along with the dollar indexes. That is a very good question. And I'm going to be honest, I have, I have no clue. I, I, last I heard, though, that 
gold and silver were doing extremely well, but I haven't heard about Bitcoin. So I will look into that and um, hopefully make a video about it. Unfortunately, banks will be in the news a lot this year because this seems to be the year that the collapse will happen and the central bank digital currency will be introduced. We'll see, obviously. I'm not a, a fortune teller, but it started pretty early in the year, so we have a long time to go before next year. And uh, I don't foresee our banks doing any better as the year progresses. Um, I wanted to see maybe one more thing here. I will work on that, though. I appreciate your input. I, I actually, of course, want the um, sound to be the most clear. That's the most important part, even more than video. So I appreciate you watching, and uh, I hope that you'll check out the next video. Um, that's all I have for this one, but I appreciate you being here. And if you like this video, please consider subscribing and uh, sharing with people. So let them know about Balance. I don't think enough people know about it. And that's why Janet Yellen can sit up there and say, we're not going to do bailouts because they're going to do bail-ins.